thank you guys for that. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for reading that meditation verse because it really does uh, make a very strong point as to what we're, you know, what we're doing at this time, which is gathering together to be able to come to understand God according to his thoughts, right? Really try to worship God according to uh, having him within our hearts. And as it says, not just on our lips, you know, and right before we, we began today, I was having a nice conversation and that was brought up even, you know, even by the people that are looking into the word, right? They're the ones that are really starting to understand that it's more about just speaking these things with our mouth, but really coming to understand. And when people say that, and, and I can hear that they're, they're really trying to come to understand God through the scriptures more, it's, it's really a blessing. It's just an incredible blessing to hear that in the world, because the more that we are connected through the word, the more that we really truly become one. You know, there's the one truth, the one spirit, the one God. And so I'm thankful to all of you guys that are here at this moment. I know we're scattered throughout throughout the world, which is pretty amazing as well. But we've gathered and used this time to come together. And I know this is something that really pleases God, really pleases, you know, Jesus. And all those that have, you know, really sacrificed and given their lives so that we could be here today. So today, as it was mentioned, um, even in the prayer, that we have been looking into what's referred to as the Lord's Prayer. And this is a prayer that Jesus had taught his disciples upon their request, right? Upon the request they had asked, they said, well, you know, John's disciples, they, they get taught how to pray. You know, the Pharisees, they, they know how to pray in these certain ways. So please teach us how to pray. And after he had listed a lot of things that were not proper when they prayed, right? He was trying to teach them first. Well, this is what you don't want to do, right? These are the things you have to watch out for. And then this is how you should pray. So we can look at this prayer as something that is really quite profound if it comes directly from the mouth of Christ and showing his disciples the kind of heart that they need to have, the kind of mindset they need to have as they're praying. And of course, there are many other prayers that Jesus did. John 17 is one of the most beautiful. If you have a chance, please read that. You know, once we, once we leave each other today, read John 17 and the prayer that he gives to his disciples. It's really quite, you know, amazing. But this particular prayer, there's a purpose to it. And many people, as we've talked about in the past, they say it just so quickly, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the King of (laughs) heaven. Right? It's really difficult to even hear what they're saying sometimes. It it could also be used as kind of like uh, what the priest will give, you know, give five Hail Marys, two Lord's prayers, and, you know, you'll be absolved, that type of thing. And so they try to just go through it as quickly as possible. But the way I want you guys to look at this prayer, and as we're going through the prayer today, I want you guys to keep this in mind, that when Jesus was speaking, right, he never spoke arbitrarily, right, meaning that he never just gave words to give words. He didn't just like to hear himself talk, but he actually had a very specific purpose when he gave the word, and he only had a very limited time to do so, right? Jesus was only on this earth for a very limited time, and when he started preaching, even less so, right, just a few years. So this prayer, if it's inside the scriptures, and if it's something that came from the very, you know, heart of our savior, then there's got to be an important purpose to it. And the purpose that I want you guys to think about as you're reading this, as we're going through it, think about it as not just a prayer for a daily activity, not just something that you're just offering for this one day, but this prayer is actually meant to help us to understand God's purpose for the time of the end. So think of this prayer as a prophecy. You may never have thought about it in this way before. I know I didn't before I had ever been shown this and actually had it opened up to me through the scriptures, had it revealed to me as to what these words actually truly meant. They were just words that would, again, pour out of my mouth, but they never really came from my heart because I had no real understanding as to what they were. So as we go through it, that's the kind of mindset in the heart I want you guys to think about when you're looking at these scriptures and realize wow, this is really something that God is leading us to understand everything for the future, right? To help us to understand his purpose, his plan. And so as we go through, that's the kind of thoughts I want you to have as it is prophecy, right? It is God's will, because that's really what prophecy is. It's God's will. If you promise something, then that becomes your desire, right? You promise it, you want it to be fulfilled. That's your desire. So within this prayer is even God's heart, God's desire. Okay, with that being said, we're going to get into the PowerPoint, and I'll go through a small little review of what we did you know, last week to tie it together, and then we'll, we'll get into the part that we were not able to, to reach, because again, it's, it's a really deep understanding. And we'll, then we'll play with some scriptures, and we'll look to see you know, how these things are connected, Old Testament and New Testament. Amen? 
Amen. All right, so let me go ahead and get a little share screen going on. Much better. All right, there we go. <laughs> so the Lord's Prayer. Hey, and this is where we can find it. Matthew chapter six, right? Matthew chapter six. It's again, Jesus was discussing this with his disciples. His disciples were like, well, help us out, right? This is what we want to learn. We want to know how to have that connection. So as I said before, he begins by saying, well, this is what they're doing that you shouldn't do. You know, think about God in this way. Think about what God desires. And when you do that, think about it in this way and pray in this way right? Pray in this way, okay? So this is the, the beginning of it when he's actually talking to his disciples. And they say, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And I always like to really point this out because this is, again, if it's coming from Jesus himself, then it's definitely something that we should at least pay attention to, right? Some people say, well, it was just an example that Jesus gave. True, true. It is just an example, right? It is something that he is saying, this is how you can pray. But what they're failing to understand is that there's a purpose to the prayer. And if there's that purpose to the prayer and you know that purpose, then when you're praying it, it's going to mean something much deeper. Okay. Much, much deeper. So this is the prayer and we can just go through it really quickly just so that we can still have an understanding because sometimes, you know, not, not everybody says this prayer every day. I hope after, then maybe you'll have a heart that it is something that you desire to pray every day, knowing that you are asking God to really fulfill his will, right? So it says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Now, the last time we got up to about here, right? On earth as it is in heaven. Today, we're going to continue on, but first I'm going to go through a little bit more, uh, the beginning part, just so that we can connect it nicely. Okay. It says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, this part right here, forgive us our debts. You could say, forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our sins. I'm sure you probably heard it in different ways. There's a reason why I kind of lean towards saying debt. And it has to do with Matthew 18. And so I'll show you that. But like I said, it's not... Uh, it's not absolutely necessary, I would say, to say debts or trespasses or sins, because really they all mean the same. If you think about it, your debt is that sin, right? That's what you owe. You have to pay back for that sin. But unfortunately, what is the cost of it? Right? Romans 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin is death. This is why that sacrifice needed to come. And then when you think about trespassing, well, what does trespassing mean? It means that you have crossed a line right? You have, you, you're trespassing on my land. Well, how do you know that? Because there's a, there's a line where the land is, okay? So when you think about that, who are you trespassing against? Against God. And what's the line that he has set? It's the law. So if you trespass against the law, and what is that? Sin. So again, they're all connected. They're all connected. But there's a reason as I use, uh, why I use debtors. And again, it has to do with just uh, Matthew 18. And so as we go through it, Hopefully that'll become a little bit more clear. Okay. All right. So in the beginning, what did we do? We went through our father who art in heaven. Now, in order to call him our father, this was really important because we want to, right? We want to be able to call God our father. We want to have that connection, that relationship with God. But the Bible is very clear. It's not something that you can just desire and then it happens. It begins with that desire. Of course, that desire is absolutely important because without it, you won't even make the next step. But what you really need to do is to be born again, right? Born through the seed of God, born through the very word of God. So it says here, it refers to one, of course, our father, that is the spirit, spirit as well. So we have a physical father and we have a spiritual father. So what are we talking about here? Of course, we're talking about the spirit, okay? The spirit. And we looked at John chapter four, verse 24, God is spirit. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. And of course, it's speaking about the spiritual realm. When we say our father, where, where is he? He's in heaven. And there's this connection between the spiritual and the physical, right? The spiritual and the physical, the things that take place in the spiritual realm, they have a lot to do with what's in the physical realm. And the things that are taking place in the physical realm also have something to do with the spiritual realm. So Jesus is telling his disciples in Matthew 16, that whatever they bind here on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever they loose here on earth is loosed in heaven. 
Now, really what that means is if you forgive a person here on earth, they will be forgiven in heaven. If you judge them here on earth, they will be judged in heaven. There's that connection between the two, right? That connection. And then the most important is here. Only those that are born of God's seed can call God father. This was a shock to me when I first started learning about, you know, God and creation. And it's the term, the thing that you hear all the time is that everyone is a child of God, right? And it sounds so beautiful. But when I started looking into the scriptures and really having it, you know, revealed to me as to the history of what's taking place inside of God's kingdom, it made it clear that actually Jesus was very, very clear. There's two kinds of fathers. And I don't mean the physical and spiritual. I mean, within the spirit. There's two kinds of fathers. So if that's true, then what does that mean? Right? It's a beautiful thing to say that all people are the children of God, but is it biblically accurate? Now we can say everyone is part of God's creation because God is the only creator. But to be a child of God, Jesus says you have to be born of the water and the spirit. To be a child of, the God, of God, it says you have to be born again by the living and enduring word of God. So in Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, verse 38, right, 38 and 39, it talks about two kinds of seeds and two kinds of children. And here you have one, right, which is referred to as the child, the child of God, right? Sons of the kingdom. And then you have another, and this one is really powerful. It's a very powerful verse. Jesus is speaking to the leaders at that time, the actual leaders at that time. And he says, you know, your father is the devil. Wow. So what does that mean? I mean, if he says it, it's got to be true, right? Because Jesus does not lie. And he says, your father is the devil. So what does that mean? What child are they? Child of the devil. So here there's two kinds. So when we say our father in heaven, we really have to ask ourselves, what seed are we born of? If we don't even know what it means, that's something we really have to think about. And trust me, there are answers and they're found within the word. And so what do we need to do? We need to really study the word. Right? We need to come to understand the heart and the mind of God. And through this, this little prayer, it's a huge part of it. Okay, so moving on, because I know we could talk about that a lot, but it says your kingdom come. Now, this is another one that really was just so profound and beautiful and amazing to me when I heard it. So we go through a, a little bit of understanding how God's heavenly kingdom, of course, it's in the spiritual world right now, but it wasn't always the case. If you look back at the time of Genesis, God and Adam, they were actually together. It says that God was walking in the garden. He was talking with Adam. But now we have this separation between man and God. And we know that separation has to do with sin. But if sin is removed, then there's no reason that God cannot be with man once again. So he goes on. It says that there is this city called the Holy City, New Jerusalem. And in John, right, in John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, this is when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. This is that place that he's preparing. He's creating that Holy City, that spiritual kingdom. But what we find in Revelation chapter 21 is that God doesn't want to keep it away from man. It says, now that holy city, New Jerusalem, is coming down out of heaven. And what is it going to do? It's going to dwell. Where? It's going to dwell on earth. He will be with man, he says, and dwell with them. And there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. So our true desire right? Our true desire as a Christian, we may not fully understand it. Of course, we want to be with the Lord. And just like Paul says in 2 Corinthians, right? Chapter 5, he says he longs to be clothed with his heavenly dwelling. He longs to shuffle off this mortal coil and, and be with the Lord. But that's because it wasn't the time for the end. In the time of the end, what God promises is that he wants this world to be his own. You know, in scriptures like Revelation, Chapter 11, verse 15, it says, now when the seventh trumpet is blown, it says the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord, the kingdom of the world, which world, this world, right? So this is our true desire, not to die and to go up to heaven, but really for heaven to descend upon earth. 
And that's found within this prayer by that small little line, your kingdom come, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done, right? Your whose will? This is God's will. So your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what does that mean? It means where is it first, right? It's first in heaven. And then where does it have to be, right? Of course, the second place it's got to be is here on earth. So how do you know how to do it on earth unless you have seen and heard it, right? So someone has to have seen and heard the truth and then be able to act according to that truth. So in the Old Testament, God has been setting up, you know, like a precedence. He's been setting up a a structure of how he works here in this earth. So what he did was with Moses, he actually showed him. He showed him the things of heaven. He saw the vision. It says that he saw the things of heaven. In Exodus chapter 25, he says, build it exactly like the pattern I will show you. Who will show him? God will show him. So he's going to build it here on earth as the pattern that he saw in heaven. And then Jesus, this was a really interesting one too, that really uh, just kind of makes me laugh sometimes when I think about it, because, you know, people think of Jesus as just knowing exactly what to do at all times and just doing exactly what he was supposed to, right? Of course, he, he ended up doing everything he was supposed to, but why? How did he even know what to do, right? It says here in John chapter five, he says, I can do nothing except what I have seen the father doing. He says, I don't even speak the words I want to speak. It's the Father speaking through me. So he was, a, he was a tool being used by God to do what? To make sure that God's will in heaven was being done here on earth. He says, I can do nothing except what I have seen the Father doing. So Jesus actually saw the things of heaven, and then he fulfilled that here on earth. And today, it's the same thing. If we don't know God's will and carry it out on earth, then we ourselves are not following in that footstep, right? So when you look at Matthew chapter seven, verse 21, and again, a very powerful verse, one that I I really like to keep in my heart. I really seal this in my heart. And I think about it, you know, often because I don't want to have what's referred to as a superficial lip service type of faith, but I want to have that deep spiritual faith that comes from the heart. Because it says, not everyone who says to me, Right? What is that? That's words, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. So not everyone. Right? He says it clearly, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. And again, who's the ones that actually say, Lord, Lord? It's those that believe in Jesus. So we're not talking about non-believers and we're not talking about other religions. We're talking about those that would call out to Jesus as their Lord. But he says it's more than that. And that's all. That's all I'm saying. It's not that calling out is wrong. Of course, it's the right thing to do. We have to call out to God. We have to call out to Jesus. But there's more to it. And that more is knowing the will of God. And within this very prayer, within this very understanding of the Lord's prayer, you can find the will of God. So the next part, we, that was what we had gone through, and I went through it briefly for last week. Uh, this is what we've made it up to, and now we're going to get into the rest of the Lord's Prayer. And it begins with, give us today our daily bread. Now, when I first learned this and hearing this all throughout my life, of course, you think about just being thankful. Right? I'm so thankful, God, for the food that you've provided for me. I'm so thankful that you have sustained me. You know, my physical body, right? Because our physical bodies are really important. You don't want to starve. You want to be thankful for what little you have if you have little, what great you have if you have great. And so give us today, right? Give us today this daily bread, as it was called. And that's as much as I had ever thought about it. Thank you, God, for this daily bread. And to be honest, I thought that was enough. And why shouldn't it be? You're just thanking God for that little bit of sustenance that he's given you each and every day. That's what we should do. Right? We should give all that thankfulness to God. But is that the reason why Jesus actually put this into the prayer? Just simply to thank God for, for food. Well, the more that you come to understand the heart of God, the more you realize actually everything has that deeper sp- spiritual meaning, right? that deeper understanding that connects you with the heart and the mind of God. So here, what we really come to find out is that God and Jesus want us to work for spiritual food, not physical food. 
right? Well, what does that mean? Right? Spiritual food, not physical food. And how do we know this? If it was just the physical things, then really the Bible would not be that necessary because the physical things are all around us. We can see the physical things. The reason the Bible is so important is because it helps us to understand the spiritual things. God uses the physical things of the world to help us to understand the spiritual things. So just like you and I, we need food to survive. I, I, I know I do. I, you could ask my wife. She definitely, definitely doesn't like to be around me when I don't eat, right? <laughs> I get that hangry thing going on. I really try not to, but it's just my body. My, I don't know. So if you don't eat, like your body's going to tell you, right? You're going to be starving. If you don't drink water, actually you die from lack of water faster than you die from lack of food. So you need that water. You need that physical food. So it makes sense that we would need those physical things and we'd be happy and we'd be thankful that we receive those things. But God is using this to help us to understand something spiritual because you and I, you and I were more than just the flesh, right? Just like we saw that there is more than just our physical father, there's the father of our spirit. So we have the father of our spirit, then what does that mean? It means that there is something spiritual within us. And if there is physical and we take care of it physically, then if there's something spiritual, how do we have to take care of it? Spiritually, right? We have to take care of it spiritually. So here in Matthew chapter six, the very same chapter that Jesus is teaching us the Lord's prayer. So he tells us, give us today our daily bread. Go ahead and pray like that. But then later in the very same chapter, when he's teaching his disciples, he says, do not worry saying, what shall I eat? Or what shall I drink? Right? Do not worry. Didn't you just tell me to pray for it each and every day? Right? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. So in other words, God knows that we need that physical food. And then he goes on to one of the most important and beautiful verses that we always need to keep in you know keep in our heart and our mind it says but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given so seek god's kingdom and his righteousness first in john chapter 6 verse 27 jesus feeds the five you know 5000 people right with the the two fish and the five loaves of bread and there's actually much more because it said 5,000 just men, but there's many, 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 right? Are you guys seeing, when you guys see it, do you guys see the, the writing still on there? Or is it clear? It's clear. Okay, good. Because on one screen, it's still got the drawing. I just want to make sure for you guys. Okay. So it says, do not worry. This is Jesus. After the people have, have seen the, the feast of 5,000, the miracle of the 5,000, and they're searching for him. And this is what he says to them. And right, this is what he says. He says, do not work for food that spoils. Well, what kind of food spoils, right? That's physical food, right? Physical food is what spoils. This is why you can't mail it, things like that. They don't let you mail perishable foods, right? Because it's going to spoil. So he says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the son of man will give you. So there's these two kinds of food. What is this food that endures to eternal life? This is spiritual, right? So what are we supposed to be looking for? And searching for something that's referred to as spiritual food, right? The spiritual food, okay? So God's spiritual food, what is that? It represents the word. So when Jesus is telling us, give us today our daily bread, he's not actually saying, be thankful for the physical food that you have, although we should be and we can be. But the reason that he put this part in this prayer is because what he really wants us to understand is that there is spiritual food and he wants us to be able to to ask god each and every day give me the spiritual food father because who else can provide it see in the world physical food you can find many places right you can even go to the mountains and you can find different things to eat you can go to if you need to go into people's yards and i'm not saying you should okay don't don't misquote me here okay? I'm just <laughs> but you can go and get fruit from different places in the world right but where else can you find spiritual food who else is able to provide your spirit that food of life besides God? No one, right? So when Jesus was telling us to pray to God our Father, what he was telling us to ask for, for that daily food, that give us today, that bread. What was that bread? It's the word. It's the word. Jesus says in, in 
Matthew, you know, four, verse four, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Right. So here in John, uh, Jeremiah, sorry, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16 says, when your words came, right? Whose word? Of course, it's God, right? Right. When God's words came, what did he do? He ate them. <laughs> so amazing, right? So when God's word came, what is the word in reality? It's food. Food for what? Food for your spirit. So what are you asking for in the Lord's prayer? Not for the physical food. As Jesus said, that's not what you're supposed to desire. God knows you need those things. But what does he truly want us to desire? He wants us to desire the very words of God. Right? When they were, they were my joy and my heart's delight. Okay? My joy and my heart's delight. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, once again, God is equating that spiritual food is something that we truly need. It says the days are coming. Whenever you see this kind of term, this is a prophecy, right? The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. What's a famine? Right? A famine is a lack of, of food, right? In this world, if you say that people are actually in a famine, it means that they're starving. But what does it say? It says not a famine, right? Not a famine of food or thirst for water. Oh, interesting. But what kind of famine of hearing the words of the Lord. So once again, he's actually equating his word, right? To food, right? His word to food, to the very sustenance that we need to survive in this world. And God is saying that actually his word is what we need. Same thing as Jesus says, right? Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Okay. So we must eat the proper food at that proper time. And this is a very simple understanding. If you are a child, then you cannot eat, like if you're a little baby, right? You cannot eat really uh, very uh, strong things like a whole carrot, for example. You're not going to give a baby a carrot or a big piece of broccoli. Even though those things are healthy, right? Carrots, vegetables, these things are healthy for a body. But what's going to happen if a baby with no teeth gets a hold of a big piece of broccoli, right? <laughs> it's not going to be very good, right? They're going to, they could choke. So actually it could be harmful to them. So we have what's called the proper food at the proper time. Now, as the child grows, then of course you need to feed them food that's more for their age as they mature. And so here in Matthew chapter 24, and this is again, this is a prophecy, right? This is a prophecy, Matthew chapter 24. It's a prophecy for the second coming, okay? And Jesus says at that time, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his servants to do what? Right? And it's told to give them their food at the proper time. Okay, to give them their food at the proper time. Now, do you think this really has anything to do with feeding people, you know, physical bread, right? Giving them a feast when the time is right. But what did, what did Jesus actually say in the Lord's Prayer? Give us today, right? Give us today this food that we are searching for. And it's the proper food that we need, the proper food at the proper time. So if this is a prophecy for the second coming, then really when is that food meant to come? When are we begging for that food to come? We're actually begging for it at the time of the second coming. Because what is the food? The food is the word of God. So imagine in the time of the first coming, okay? Go back to the time of the first coming. In the Old Testament, right? Let's say in the Old Testament, okay? What were they eating each and every day in the Old Testament? They were eating the law, which actually came from Moses. And how long were they eating that for? They were eating that for 1,500 years, right? 1,500 years they were eating that same food. But then when Jesus came, did he feed them the same food? No, actually, what did he, what did he feed them? We were talking about it. What did he do with the law? He said he didn't abolish the law. He, what did he do? He fulfilled the law. And then he taught them the fulfillment. This became that new food at the proper time. So for 1,500 years, they were eating the same food. But then when Jesus came, he gave them something new. He gave them what's referred to as fulfillment. That was the food they were eating at that time. Now, what's been going on for 2,000 years? What have we been eating? We've been eating this food right here, right? For 2,000 years. 
But soon there's going to be the time of revelation. And revelation is prophecy. Just like in the Old Testament, if the law itself was fulfilled, then the law was prophecy. So in the time of revelation, once again, there's going to be that food that we need to desire. This is what we've been praying for, for 2,000 years in the Lord's Prayer, right? This is what we've been praying for. And that term today, that term is so important. Give us today our daily bread, right? It's a specific time, actually, that God is talking about. Because again, it's prophecy, okay? Prophecy. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says that prophecy or revelation awaits an appointed time. It waits for an appointed time. So when that time comes, that's when we'll be able to receive it. So in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Therefore, God again, what did he do? He set a certain day. He set a certain day calling it today. So there's this certain day that he, he names it today, right? We think of today as just today, right? It's not yesterday. It's not tomorrow. It's today. But actually this today, it's a certain day that he has set, meaning it's a prophecy. And when that time comes, it will be fulfilled. And you will say, it is that day today, the day that God has desired, the day that he has promised. And that's what the Lord's Prayer has been telling us to pray for. Give us today, at that time, when that fulfillment comes, what will we receive? We will receive the fulfillment, the proper food at that time. And that's what we are desiring. Okay. Again, there's a lot more I'd love to talk about, but, but then I wouldn't be able to finish for you today. So <laughs> moving on. It says, forgive us our debts. And this is why, again, as I talk about the debts, forgive us our debt. Right? Forgive us our debt as we forgive others. So important. Probably one of the easiest things to explain, but the hardest thing for some people to do. It really is. People talk to me quite often about, you know, how do I forgive these people that have done these things? And I said, if you really understood what happens if you don't, it would really help you to. You know, you're not just doing it for selfish or, you know, personal you know, reasons. You really should do it because it's the right thing to do. But you also have to realize that there's so much that happens if you don't forgive. Even the fact that you're only punishing yourself, really. You know, when you have that hate in your heart, you have that anger in your heart, it's really only punishing yourself. But learning that forgiveness is something that's absolutely necessary in the eyes of God can help us to make that step as well. And realizing that God is the judge. So it's not as if God's going to forget what happened. Of course, God is the one that's going to judge. It says that in. You know, in Romans chapter 12, leave room for God's judgment. You, you forgive, you love, you bless, and God will take care of the rest. Okay. But what we have to realize is that God sent his son, his only son, as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So we are being forgiven of something that we really should have, you know, we have no reason to be forgiven. And so if we think about what God has done for us, then we can forgive others when they do foolish and simple things. I know that there are some things that are, you know, they're very large, they're big. And I know that people have a problem with forgiveness in many ways. But I promise you, if you really come to understand, you know, heaven and hell, if you really come to understand the time of the end, if you really come to understand the power of God, then there is no judgment, there is no, you know, hate in your heart that can match what could possibly happen to those people? And so for your own sake, for your own spirit, learn to forgive. Learn to let go of those things, right? So we see it says, Jesus told us for, to forgive and love others. This is the most important part. If you say that you love Jesus, if you say that you want to be a true Christian, a true believer in Christ, then we have to love, we have to forgive. You can't be both, right? Even John says that if you don't have love for your brothers in your heart and claim to be a believer in God and Jesus, then really we're not, we're not speaking truth because we have to have that love, right? Okay. So in Matthew chapter 18, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times, I love this because, you know, really, what a question, right? How many times do I really have to forgive them? Like, really? <laughs> How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? 
right? Because this guy, he's done it eight times. So can I not forgive him anymore, right? And what does Jesus say? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. In other versions, it even says 70 times seven, right? <laughs> In other words, you have to just keep forgiving. If they make a mistake and if they come and they apologize and they beg for forgiveness, of course, you should forgive because who are you? As Jesus says, when they caught the woman and they, they think of it as, you know, she's caught in adultery and they are surrounding her with stones and they're going to throw that stone. And what does Jesus say? He says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And what happens? They all fade away. Why? Because we all have sin. Not one of us is perfect. Not one of us is without sin. And then knowing that, knowing that God has forgiven us for the things that we have done will help us to forgive others as well, right? So what does Jesus say? My command is this, my command. You know, in John, John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus says, if you love me, right? If you love me, you will obey my commands. So if you really do love Jesus, then we have to follow this. It says, love each other as I have loved you. So learning that what we have to do is love, forgive, and bless, right? Love, forgive, and bless. And that's all found within this, this short little prayer. So this is the part that really we have to think about. If we do not forgive, then we will not be forgiven. If we do not forgive others, then we ourselves, we are keeping ourselves from receiving that forgiveness. No matter how many times you call out to the Lord, no matter how many times you go to church or pray or read the Bible, if you are unwilling to forgive others, then God is very clear what could happen. So in Matthew chapter 18, once again, and this is where I, I talks about the debt. Okay, there's the, the unmerciful servant is what it's called, right? The unmerciful servant. There is this time where a person owes 10,000 talents of gold. And if you know what a talent of gold is, it weighs like 20 pounds. Imagine having 20 pounds of gold and now imagine 10,000 <laughs> talents of gold. It's, it's a number that you cannot fathom. It's a, a debt that could never be repaid. And so what happens when he begs for forgiveness? He's forgiven. He's forgiven. But that same person that's forgiven goes and finds somebody who owes him just a few denaries, just a couple of pennies. And he says, pay me back. He's like, I can't, I can't pay you back. So what does he do? He, he takes him, throws him in jail. He's going to throw his whole family in jail. It's terrible. So someone sees this happen and he goes back to the first person. He says, hey, you remember that guy that you forgave? The one that you forgave those thousands and thousands of talents of gold? Do you know what he's done? for just a few pennies. So the person goes to him. It says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers until he should pay back, pay back all he owed, which he never could. It's a debt he could never repay. Well, what's the debt that we have? Right? What's the debt that you and I have? We are born into original sin. We have hereditary sins that have been passed down generation after generation, but even more so, we have our own personal sin. None of us are perfect. None of us have understood God perfectly. And every time that we worship God falsely, that's sin. Every time that we don't understand the truth and we may pray in a false way, that's sin. Every time that we accept false teachings, that's sin. All of us have that debt that we have to pay. And as I said in you know, Romans, right? Romans chapter six, verse 23. It says the wages of sin is death. That's the debt that we have to pay. And I cannot pay your debt because I have my own debt, right? If someone were to say, you know, this person owes me uh, $10,000 and you go like, well, I'll pay, I'll pay him. And you're like, what are you talking about? You owe me $10,000 too, right? <laughs> pay me your debt first, right? So I can't pay your debt because I already have my own debt. But who's the one that came without debt? Who's the one that came without sin? That was Jesus. He died for our sins to pay that debt. So if he paid that debt for us, then who are we to keep that debt on someone else? Who are we to not forgive someone, especially when it's something so foolish or so simple or so stupid, and we hold that in our hearts? So what does it say? This is how my heavenly father, right? This is how God will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from where? From the heart. Again, not lip service, but really truly from the heart. And I know this is not easy. As I said, probably the easiest thing to, to understand and one of the most difficult things to do.
Okay? But does that mean that we should not do it? No, of course not, right? We have to. So we have to learn how to forgive. And you really can do that by understanding the heart and the mind of God. Okay? Lead us away from temptation and evil. So it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, of course, every single day we are going through some temptation or evil or things of this nature. But really what this is about is, again, a prophecy. It's leading for the time of the end. Because Jesus says, in the time of the end, unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of people that do not overcome. They do not endure. So what does he want us to do? To endure patiently and overcome at the proper time. In Matthew chapter 10, it says, all men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So it's not a matter of just believing for a time. It's not a matter of, of doing, well, I've done enough, right? I've done enough. It's never that. It's remaining faithful all the way through to the end. Right? And Revelation chapter 3, and of course, this is prophecy for the second coming. Revelation chapter 3 says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, endure patiently, right? I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. This is really what we are asking in the Lord's prayer that God helps us to overcome. Lead us not into temptation because at this moment in time, that is when that temptation of through the whole world, it says. So what we are praying for is to overcome that temptation at the proper time. And when is that time comes? At the time of the end, there's going to be that time of deception that time of betrayal. As it says in 2 uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Concerning the coming. Right? He had already come before, so this is the when? It's the second coming. And in Hebrews, right? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, it says that when, the, when Jesus comes again, what is he going to do? He's going to come to bring salvation. So when it says concerning the coming of our Lord, it's concerning what? Salvation. Right? It says he does not come a second time to bear sin, but he comes to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So concerning salvation, concerning the coming of our Lord, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come. When? Until. So we're waiting for, state, for things to happen first. What's going to happen? The rebellion and then destruction. So when it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, this is what we're asking for. At the time of the second coming, when this deception takes place, what do you and I have to do? We have to pray each and every day that we do not fall for that deception. We do not fall for that destruction, but we remain faithful until the time of the end. Because unfortunately, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, which is the signs of the second coming, that many people will not hold on to the truth. So the, G, the disciples came up to him and said, you know, on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will these things happen? What will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? So when is this going to happen? What's going to be the ending? And what's going to be the signs for your coming? He says at that time, right? At the time of the second coming, what will happen? Many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. That's the rebellion. That's the betrayal. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. That's the destruction. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And what did Jesus say? Hold on to that love, that love for each other. So because of all the wickedness that will ta be taking place, where? Not in just the world, but inside of God's kingdom. Because these were believers. They're turning away from the faith, meaning that they had faith to begin with. They had faith to begin with. So we have to make sure that this is what we are praying for each and every day with the Lord's Prayer, right? It's not just a bunch of words put together. It's not something to just ramble out of your mouth, but every single word is something to meditate on. Every word is to help us to understand that we have to hold on and maintain our faith, to have love in our hearts, to forgive others, to ask God, please, God, give me that proper food, that teaching that I need at that proper time. And God, we ask you, please, Please, Father, to come to this world. That's the Lord's Prayer. It says, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Now, this is not something that you find in Matthew 6. So many people will ask me, well, is it proper to say this then? In the Lord's Prayer, is it proper to say this at the end? Now, if you don't feel that it is, you don't have to. You could end it right there. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. But what we're doing and what we should always do, and what I hope you and I do continuously, is to give all that glory back to God. Right? It's not us that does anything. It's not us through our own power. Even our prayer. This is really amazing to think about. But our prayers are not powerful because you and I are powerful. Right? I can't do anything like that. Our prayers are powerful because of who hears our prayers. God is the one who hears our prayers and God is all powerful. So if we pray in line with his will, if we ask according to his heart, then God has the ability and the power to help us to be able to receive what we need. So it's not you and I that are powerful, but it's God that's powerful. So what should we always do? Always give that glory back to God. So is this something that we should do? It's more than, than that. It's something that we absolutely have to do, right? And is it proper? Well, it is proper. And I'll show you why. Because time and time again, all of creation gives all glory and power back to God. So here in Revelation chapter 12, when it talks about God's kingdom has come, it comes after the war. And this is what we're praying for. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So in Revelation chapter 12, it says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven that said, Now. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God. Right? Right there. So what are we doing? We are giving all glory back to God. We are asking for this time to come. And it says now, which means it did not happen before. What had to happen? It says, and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers. Who is that? That's Satan. Who accuses them before, uh, before our God day and night has been hurled down. So once this war takes place, once this has happened, then what will take place? God's salvation, power, and kingdom will come. Just like it says in Hebrews chapter 9 as well. Right? That salvation will come. Okay? God's kingdom, power, and glory. This is what all creation is going to be giving back to God. So in Revelation chapter 7, this is when you have the 144,000, what's referred to as the kingdom and priests, and you have the great multitude in white, a number that is so vast, no one could count. What does it say? And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the lamb saying, amen, praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So what do we say at the end of the Lord's prayer? For yours is the kingdom and the power forever and ever, right? Okay, the last says, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for true and just are his judgments. So the reason I like to you know, add this in and show is that it's not just something that we should say. It's something that we absolutely must say. It's not just that, you know, is it proper to say this at the end of the Lord's prayer? We don't find it in the Lord's prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer, but it's giving all glory back to God. So really at the end of any prayer, at the end of any sermon, at the end of anything that we do for God, what should we always do? Give all that glory back to God. So once again, what is the Lord's prayer? It's not just a simple prayer that he was teaching them to make it easy for them, but it's a prayer that is so deep and so spiritual. It encompasses all 6,000 years of God's history. It encompasses all of God's will and his purpose for the time of the end. And if you and I say it with that kind of a, a knowledge and understanding, then we're not just offering lip service, but we're actually praying from the heart. Right? So in conclusion, says, after seeing and hearing the prayers of the self-righteous leaders of Israel, Jesus taught his disciples to pray to God in a humble and contrite way, to not seek for one's own glory or needs, but to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's Prayer, although it is only a few words, encompasses all of God's will for the time of the end. Without knowing the meaning and just repeating the words, we are not worshiping God in truth, but are simply offering lip service. Let us all come to know the truth and pray to God from the heart in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Go ahead and stop that. So again, today, 
we went through the, the rest of what was referred to as the Lord's Prayer. It's called the Lord's Prayer because obviously Jesus is the one who taught it to his disciples um, from their request, right? Jesus, Lord, you know, Rabbi, teach us. Teach us how we should pray to God. And what does Jesus say? Our Father who art in heaven. He gives them the understanding that God is now their father, the father of their spirits. And where is he? He's in heaven. But what does he want? He wants to come, right? Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. So we've learned this understanding that we live a good life, we die, and we go to heaven. Of course, we want to live a good life. But really, our true desire is not to be separated from this, this physical world for all time. What we really should desire and what we may not have understood is that God's desire, God's heart, is not to be separate from his creation any longer. But God wants to be one with his creation. But when we learn what took place, that there is a consequence of that sin in this world, and the major consequence is that God and man have been separate. But this is what's been causing all of the problems of the world. So what does God want to do? He wants to renew the world. He wants to re remove the sin of this world. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and he died for our sins, but sin is still rampant in this world. Why? Because the source of sin is still in this world. But in the time of revelation and what we've been praying for in the Lord's prayer is that that time will come to an end. And at that time, you and I will be fed that knowledge and that wisdom as that true food at that proper time. Amen. So my hope and desire for each one of you is that you have that hunger <laughs> and that thirst for that knowledge. And that's why we provide those those studies that we get together and we, do, we truly discuss these things deeply. And that is the most important thing that you can do for your spirit is to, is to get together and to study these things, to truly come to understand God through the word. Amen? Amen. All right, so I'm going to end it with a closing prayer and then I'll pass it back on to the presider. Dear Heavenly Father, you truly are the creator of the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them and the giver of life to our spirits through that proper food at the proper time. Father, we are so thankful for your son who came 2000 years ago to teach us the knowledge and the wisdom that we need to come to understand you, to know your will and your purpose for the time of the end. But I feel, Father, and I'm worried about the, the world at this time and the Christians of this world who have become complacent and have fallen asleep, those that do not truly desire to know you through the word, Father. And I ask you, please, Father, to help them to wake up, to put that fire in their hearts, Father, to help them to have that longing to be with you through the word, to desire to truly know and understand your prophecies, your will for the time of the end. Father, I pray for each person that is here. You know the heart that they have, the position that they are in, the situations of their life. Please, Father, provide everything that they need in abundance to be able to overcome and to have that desire, Father, to walk this life of faith until the very end. Father, as we have seen that there is that deception, there is that betrayal that comes, we ask you please always, Father, to keep us from this, to help us to have and maintain our faith truly strong, Father, through the word. And Father, we did not come empty-handed at this time, but we have our small offerings that we would like to offer to you, Father, to help with this kingdom, to help for the work to be done throughout the world. We are truly grateful for everything that you have done for us, Father. We ask you please always to send your ministering angels to protect and watch over us and to look upon us with mercy and forgiveness, Father, to help us to be created more and more into your image each and every day. We offer all glory, all power, all thanks, and all praise to you, Father. And we pray this in your Son's most righteous and holy name, he who died upon the cross for our sins, Father. Through his blood, we are forgiven. Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys again so much for this time. I truly appreciate it. And again, we're always here if you guys have questions. Uh, if you want to know anything more, please, please just let us know. Okay. All right. I'll pass it back on to the presider. Thank you so much.